Joining me now to discuss all of the things that we've seen throughout the day, former U.S. attorney and NBC News contributor Joyce Vance, former federal prosecutor and Georgetown School of Law professor Paul Butler, and writer at large for The Bulwark, Tim Miller. I love this panel because we saw a lot today, so let's break it down. Joyce, I want to start with you and get your reaction to the question and answer portion of the trial, which is just uh, what we watched for most of this afternoon, and also what we heard from the defense today. What is the case uh, to defend Donald Trump as you see it laid out by, the, by his trial team? It's tough to make out a case to defend the former president on these facts. And so a lot of what we heard today, Zerlina, was, was just uh, smoke and, and whistles, really. It was an effort to, to do more to cloak the truth than to actually reveal it. So we heard a little bit of a resurgence of this argument that for jurisdictional reasons, because Trump is out of office, that he can't be properly tried. And of course, Representative Raskin was quick to dismiss that, pointing out the Senate had already concluded that it had jurisdiction to try the case. Then there was an effort to disassociate the president from insurrection. And this, I think, becomes the key going forward. There will be an effort, as we've seen Trump do so many times, to throw those around him under the bus while disclaiming personal responsibility. A lot of that going on today. Yeah, it seemed to me like, Tim, they were trying to make a case that the violence it, it certainly was foreseeable because it was those people under there that have nothing to do with Donald Trump who are organizing this. It was very much planned. Look at the, what the FBI said. Um, and it seems to me that by distancing or attempting to distance Donald Trump from what happened after his speech, it's just to give Republicans a reason to acquit. Is it, that essentially what you saw today as the defense tried to um, put up a defense for Donald Trump? Yeah, uh, look, their strategy, to the extent it was a strategy, was to provide talking points for the Republican senators to share when they go on television, on Fox News, and in front of the media to allow them to kind of what about Donald Trump's actions and to make semantic distinctions about, you know, the technical definition of incitement and, you know, citing Brandenburg and this and that. Uh, there, there was no effort to actually acquit Donald Trump on the merits. Uh, because you can't, uh, you know, it's an open and shut case. It was obvious. It's obvious to anyone that if it was not for Donald Trump, as, as, as Cicilloni said, but for Donald Trump, uh, Brian Sicknick would be alive today. Um, I think that's very clear right now. And so you can't make a case on the merits. And so, you know, what they wanted to do is give give Republicans talking points. And, and you just notice the difference between the House manager's presentation, which is basically begging Republican senators to vote, bending over backwards, being nice to them versus Trump's defense case, which insults and demeans Democrats. And, and you know, they're just trying to get their 50 votes and move on. Yeah, and Tim, it was also the way in which they were trying to make the false equivalence. So they use video of a lot of black women, um, a lot of black women talking above whisper tones, um, Maxine Waters and others, Ayanna Presley, they didn't say her name right, but it was Ayanna Presley, um, using the, that tape over and over and over to, to say, well, these Democrats over here, they use the word fight a lot. And so I guess that is supposed to defend Donald Trump, but I'm always like, there was no insurrection after Maxine Waters said anything or Ayanna Presley said fight or Elizabeth Warren stood in a kindergarten classroom and told everybody to fight. There was no insurrection. There was only an insurrection in this case. So how can you make that false equivalence? Like, how does that work on Republican senators? Yeah, I, I also noticed that, that, you know, when they said the word fight, it wasn't um, to fight uh, against a fabricated stolen election that the president had made up and brought people to Washington to do. Look, that's what I'm saying. This is a, this was a semantic what about us debate. Look, that works on Fox, right? You know, if, if uh, John Hoven from North Dakota wants to do an interview on Hannity, he can say, well, look at what Kamala said, you know, the one time. And look at when Chuck Schumer, you know, one time said, release the storm or whatever it was that he said. And, and that works there. And that's all they need. They just want to keep their voters happy. They're not trying to convince, convince anyone. And that's why they refused repeatedly. You would see the lawyers refuse to discuss the context. They say, you only need to look at these words. The words are the only thing that matters. The fact that Donald Trump 
fabricated this grand conspiracy and brought thousands and thousands of people to Washington at the very moment we were supposed to have a peaceful transition of power. You can't talk about any of that. You have to just talk about the words, and that's how they get into this kind of semantic what about us debate. You just have to think about it through the context of who they're trying to convince. They're, they're just making sure that the choir feels comfortable, and that was the strategy. It wasn't a strategy to win anyone over. That's a good way to put it, making sure the choir feels comfortable. Um, Paul, you had an op-ed in the Washington Post where you concluded that if the GOP's conservative principles actually matter, Republican senators should play by the rules. And that means considering the case on the merits and voting to convict. What conservative principles are you referring to? Uh, and why should that be the, you know, the driving force for these Republican senators who, at the end of the day, they're going to have to go to bed at night with whatever decision they come to. They're the ones that are going to have to look at themselves in the mirror. So how about law and order, Zerlina? How about the rule of law? How about patriotism? So on the jurisdictional issue, the Senate debated this for eight hours on Tuesday, and then they voted. So the deal was if the majority said that it's unconstitutional to try a former president, the Senate would dismiss the case. If, on the other hand, the majority said it was constitutional, they would proceed to trial. And that's what happened. Uh, but the losers of that debate said, now, no, it's our own personal view of the Constitution that should prevail. Well, that's nice, but that's not the rule of law. That's not law and order. That's not following the rules, which are, again, these values that conservatives proclaim uh, to champion. And so if I were the House managers now, I'd be just as plucky as we see Jamie Raskin. He's still tonight going to consult with his team, thinking there's got to be a way that we can peel off 17 of these GOP senators. And I think he will try to appeal to those same values, which is why we're hearing a lot about the police officers, the brave officers, including, of course, Officer Goodman. It's to appeal to their patriotism. Yesterday we heard a lot about how the Capitol was attacked the first time since the War of 1812. Again, that's also about law and order and patriotism. If they have any values, if they are actually conservatives, then this should move them. And if it doesn't, that's quite telling. Yeah, I think it is quite telling, but certainly, Joyce, it seems to me that, you know, one of the other standout points from today is that, you know, they tried really hard to use constitutional law and say, you know, free speech, free speech, free speech. This is what the First Amendment means. Um, Donald Trump has his First Amendment rights. Um, and I feel like we sort of need a, a demystification for the folks at home that aren't familiar with the Brandenburg v. Ohio decision. So, Joyce, break this down for us. What is the defense they are trying to make um, in terms of the First Amendment to defend Donald Trump's conduct and his speech? And what is the, what is the, the appropriate legal standard in this impeachment trial? The claim here is that the former president's speech is protected by the First Amendment, so he can't be impeached for it. But that's a mismatch of legal doctrines. What the law here actually does is it protects people from being prosecuted for speech that's protected by the First Amendment. In other words, you can march down the street in a Nazi armband. It's reprehensible conduct. You can't be prosecuted for it. It's free speech. That doesn't carry over to impeachment, Zerlina, because impeachment is not the same as charging someone with criminal conduct. There's something else going on here, and that's evaluating whether the former president violated his oath of office, failed to uphold the laws and protect the country, and should be impeached as a result. And the First Amendment doesn't provide him with any protection in that regard. Over a hundred scholars from across the political divide signed a letter explaining that fact. And they went a little bit further and they said, even if the First Amendment uh, applied to impeachment, 
it still wouldn't protect Trump because his conduct was much more like the person who yells fire in a crowded movie theater, something that the First Amendment doesn't protect because it subjects people to risk than traditionally protected free speech. So here, because Trump's conduct, his speech, was intended to incite violent behavior, the First Amendment doesn't shelter him even during an impeachment. That's about as simple as I can make yeah, a very complex subject. No, for real though, it is very complex and constitutional law is a hard class for that specific reason because, you know, this is all very complicated. There are a lot of different pieces. And Paul, Trump's defense spent a large part of their presentation equating the Capitol riot to the unrest we saw last summer. So we were just talking to Congresswoman Maxine Waters about how they used her image. They used images of other black women, um, Kamala Harris, using the word fight, I guess, to make them look like the angry black woman or the scary black woman to, you know, make their particular audience um, be like, look at those Democrats and what they're saying over there. They're riling people up. But I just feel like there was no insurrection. What, how is that an effective argument in your view, Paul, if there was not a subsequent insurrection after Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren or whoever else said the word fight over and over? So, Zerlina, it's not like you were off that day when there was a BLM <laughs> insurrection where they took over the Capitol. That never happened. Uh, nothing that any African-American woman or woman of color has said has inspired an angry mob to go after the lawmakers on Capitol Hill. So it's a non-starter. And again, I think it's glorification to even call it a defense. I have too much respect for defense attorneys to call anything that we heard from Trump's lawyers today a real defense. It's more like they invited the Republicans over to watch YouTube and chill for a couple of hours. And it's not only stunningly inept, it's disrespectful to the process because it's almost a frank acknowledgement that most of the Republican senators don't really care about the evidence or about arguments. They're just biding time until they can vote not guilty. Tim, do you think that that's true? Do you think they're just waiting uh, for the day when the vote comes up and they're going to vote to acquit and they're going to move on and they're going to maybe pretend like none of this ever happened? Do you think that's what they're going to do? And do you think it will work? Because for me, I feel like it's going to be hard to forget insurrection. And so every single Republican is going to be on record forever voting to acquit or voting to convict for the history books, not just for the next election. Is that weighing on their minds at all? You would think so, but I don't think it is. Um, and, and I do think it will look very, very bad 10, 15, 20 years down from now. I, I think that, you know, history will judge uh, them for acquitting him harsh or quite harshly. I, I don't know how much will matter in 2022 and 2024, right? I mean, like things, you know, a lot of things change fast in our politics. Um, looking at things through political lens is different than historical lens. I think a lot of them basically look at what happened in November and say, hey, had 90,000 votes switched, what in the right states, we control all of Washington. You know, more people voted for Donald Trump than any other president in history. Yeah, also even more voted for Biden, right? But I, I think that they look at this and say, uh, we are, we're stuck with Donald Trump, we're pregnant with him. I, I personally disagree with that, but that is the mindset uh, of a vast majority of the Republican caucus. And so I, I wish the Democrats, I, I wish the Democrat House managers, my only complaint about them is I wish that they would have called witnesses. There, I guess, is a chance tomorrow that, that there might be a vote on that, but it seems like they'll move straight to conviction. I would like to pressure the Republican senators more. Uh, you saw at least Bill Cassidy changed his mind. Maybe you could get a couple more, but getting to 17 is really hard to envision. But it, isn't that sort of strange, right? We go into a trial, Tim, where all 100 senators take an they swear an oath to be impartial, and yet yeah. we know they're not impartial. And yet there are no real tangible consequences for violating that oath, even in this, in this short-term uh, trial. It seems to me that what are they doing there if not just hoping to get reelected the next time? What is their, yeah, what is their principles, going back to sort of Paul's point? Yeah, they're not just not impartial. They're, some of them are accessories. 
Right. I mean, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, uh, you know, there were eight of them initially that were planning on voting to overturn the election that day. So, you know, they at some level are involved in this. I think the Democratic House managers have been very generous, by the way, in not calling them out on that more aggressively. So, uh, you know, look, I think that this is a very short term political calculation. Rand Paul said, I think he was right on about this. If they vote to convict, a third of their voters will go away to the MAGA Patriot Party. And we can't let that happen. And so I, I just think that they're putting principles aside, they're putting history aside, they're putting the facts aside, and with the exception of a couple um, who, you know, like Cassidy and Romney, who actually seem to be engaging on the merits today in their questions, uh, with the exception of them, the rest of them are making a purely political judgment, and, and that's just it. I mean, yeah, yes, it's crazy, yes, it's disgusting, yes, you name the word, but that, that's what's happening. Yeah, and one day we're going to really ask somebody to seriously answer the question, do you want white nationalists in your political coalition? Maybe it is a third of your coalition. Do you want them there? That's the question that I have, because I think that the answer should be no, but I guess not, because if they're votes, they're votes, and it doesn't matter if they're white nationalists. Joyce Vance, Paul Butler, and Tim Miller, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an open question, I guess, at this point. And Tim Miller, thank you so much for being here to break all of that down. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.